S and C. Strength and strength and conditioning. Now, here's the thing, Eric. There's a lot of people on the internet that are in quotation strength coaches, uh, which means mm. self appointed, uh, which means that they maybe have found love in powerlifting, decided to do it, found that maybe some of the things that they do are slightly repeatable and have developed due to their following and due to their lifts a coaching team, and so they have individuals that they coach, but that doesn't make you a strength and conditioning coach. Which is a, it's an entirely different thing. Absolutely. And it, especially when you're thinking about being a professional strength and conditioning coach <clears throat> at, say, a Division I uh, university for multi, uh, multi sports, or maybe even working for a professional NFL or NHL team. Yeah. Um, man, like you can imagine if someone had done all of that, and maybe also been an Olympic caliber shot putter, like they might have some good perspective on on what SNC really is. Introducing our everyone needs to. I think we explore with iron culture, uh, the science, the history, the culture lifting, and oftentimes it's an amalgam. It's a combination of those three things. And our guest today, Jan Picka. Uh, his ability, first off, as an athlete, as a lifter, someone that's passionate, someone who's been a strength and conditioning coach for longer than we've been alive, um, who's mm. lived the damn thing, breathed it, and he's also open. We had this discussion before where sometimes you have some of those old school either lifters, coaches, where they're pretty – they can become more dogmatic or resilient where it's uh, their way or the highway. But what's super cool also about Jan is not only the respect for the history and the culture, but also looking forward where he works with Mike Zordos who works with you on mass monthly apl applications and strength sports. And he was just talking about some of the latest research that Mike is doing. So someone also, while he's been in the sport, been in the game for a long period of time, he's looking towards the future and he's looking also to learn. Yeah, uh, Co Coach Picka pretty much bleeds the ethos of, of iron culture. I mean, science, culture, and history. Um, he's, he's, he's met, been around, trained with, trained under some of the legends in the iron game uh, who, man, you'll hear a lot of cool names in this episode. Uh, that's the history side of it. Yep. Um, he, uh, as an athlete, coach, and researcher, he's, he's experienced all these things. You know, he was talking about defending his master's thesis and I'm pretty sure that that might have been looking at uh, EMG in quadriceps activity and resistance training. I, I could be wrong. Uh, we didn't actually get into that in this episode. There was so much we could have covered. But he is, he's been an active exercise science researcher. He teaches biomechanics, advanced strength conditioning. And he's also a practitioner. Uh, you know, he's worked with the New England Patriots as the head strength conditioning coach. He's worked at University of Tulane as the head strength conditioning coach. And then as an athlete, uh, he not only competed in weightlifting for many years, but used that to supplement his career as a thrower. And uh, he made the 1980 uh, Olympic team as an alternate. Uh, so it's it's pretty rare that you see all that going on. And and like you said, still a very open-minded individual. Um, you know, not not at all set in his ways, and very much living uh, the lessons you get from the iron of always trying to learn, improve. And kind of that progressive overload, mental, physically, and spiritually, is something he's applying. And it's, it was just very, very cool to hear uh, his life experiences and what he's taken from it and how much it paralleled many of our other guests, many of the things we've talked about. Um, and just to hear him you know, pay a lot, like a lot of respect, like you said, to some of the new cutting-edge research while also uh, emphasizing uh, what, what works, works, and, and being very much uh, a good, observant coach and uh, being able to take... Uh, you know, clear cut old school training and apply it to many, many different individuals to get sustainable, uh, you know, repeatable results yeah. and having that lead him towards consistent success in the S&C field. I think all of that is a very interesting blend of everything that, that Iron Culture is about. Plus, I mean, let's be honest, Eric, he brought up our boy John Grimmick. And as soon as you bring up the Grimmick and the fact that he was doing the polka at the tender age of 80 years old, you're already just old school iron you're in the call we welcome you with open arms and tying everything if you're a listener and we do see that basically uh 80 or 90 percent of people will listen to every single episode that people are listening to the iron culture episodes um everything kind of does become tied together where we got a little bit of that flair yep. talking about the uh fitness industrial complex where he was talking about him writing an article basically explaining the supremacy in most situations of free weights over machines, but how there are corporate interests where there's advertisers for the machines. And so the article that he wrote was never published. Just It's like a snapshot into the world of being an SNC coach, but also someone passionate about lifting and trying to provide 
really good information where he gave that story and I found myself nodding in agreement where after he got his degrees, he was in a gym and he would just help people without charging them because he just wanted to talk about lifting. He wanted to breathe it. He had many stories about him leading up to those Olympic trials. If passion is your first mover, everything kind of falls into place from there. Absolutely. It's the one non-negotiable. You know, if you're a strength conditioning coach, if you're an athlete, if you're an academic or if you're a trainer, uh, you're not going to have certain things figured out immediately. As a personal trainer, you're not going to have your business down. You may not even be a very good programmer to start. As an athlete, you're maybe you don't know how to move yet. But if you are passionate about your sport, if you're passionate about your clients, if you're passionate about your research, um, you will find a way forward and you'll end up uh, pushing yourself to be better so that you can fill all in those weak gaps. But if you don't have passion, just like Omar brought up, you brought up in this episode, how 90% of personal trainers are in a different career field a few years <laughs> later, I think probably the, uh, the the key missing element in a lot of them, if I had to guess, would be a lack of passion. A lack of passion is fatal. I think everyone, even if you're not interested in becoming a SNC coach or personal trainer, maybe you're just an iron, a fellow iron enthusiast. I think there's a lot to learn. I hope everyone enjoys this episode with Coach Jan Picka. Here with the legendary, am I saying this right, Jan? It's Jan Picka. Last name, is that how we, yeah? Perfect. Perfect, Omar. Thank you. Well, you you did just tell me five minutes ago, so it'd be kind of embarrassing if I've messed it up. But I can sympathize, Jan, because I have a last name that's a little harder to pronounce. It's just not super common. And as soon as you said Jan, it made sense to me because there's a jazz fusion keyboard. It's called Jan Hammer. Uh, that's very popular. And so as soon as you said, I'm like, oh, right, that makes sense. Um, and so we get names right around here at Iron Culture. We, we don't get facts right, but we get names right. <laughs> cool, cool. Jan Hammer is a famous guy. I like him. I like that you like him, man. He's he's honestly fantastic. Yep, yep. Miami Vice. He did a lot Yo. of Miami Vice stuff. He's in. As uh, Sean, the, the gym owner of uh, the gym that I go to, Jan, uh, he calls me a renaissance man just because like I like some 70s fusion, 60s. So he's he's 55, and he'll throw references to me, and we get like we'll talk weather report, this and that. And he's just like, man, you're born at the wrong time. I'm like, or oh, I just have too much time on my hand. I listen to a lot of music. <laughs> Yeah, it's good music. Yeah. Well, Coach Picka, honored to have you on. Um, for for those who don't know, uh, Dr. Mike Zerdos, who is on for our auto regulation roundtable, no. uh, recommended you very highly to me. And uh, just because you have such a really cool history uh, with strength conditioning, sport in general, uh, and now you are, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're currently, you teach strength conditioning courses at uh, Florida Atlantic University? I do. I teach uh, kinesiology, biomechanics, and advanced strength conditioning. Yeah, Love. done that for about ten years. So you've been not only a uh, a practitioner, uh, an athlete, but you're also now a an educator in this field. Um, I was looking at your at your CV, and I was looking and thinking of the similarities to my own because I have some practical experience and also academic. And I noticed that I think you got your CSCS, or at least you joined the NSCA. Uh, I don't know when they actually developed the CSCS when I was about three. So <laughs> Thank, I think, thanks for that. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, no worries. That, that, yeah. that, that, uh, we can't let you just feel really good about yourself on the podcast. We have to remind you also of it's you know, the, the, the never ending entropy of life. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We all have to live it. Yeah, that's right. So, so you got your, uh, you joined the NSCA at a time, uh, when it probably had only been recently formed. Is that accurate? It was a couple of years. I think it was uh, 83 or I want to say 83 or 84. Uh, mm -hmm. I started my first job at uh, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in 85, and I was certified in 86. So it was uh, three or four years prior to uh, prior to me taking the exam. That to me is really cool because I mean the uh, the strength and conditioning profession is is a very young profession historically, and you've been there very much from its early beginnings. And I think that that there's probably a lot of really cool transformations or maybe not very cool, but interesting transformations that you've likely seen over the years. Um, just to give you a little more uh, uh, kudos for, for the listeners, you've been a, a professional strength conditioning coach at the uh, professional level, also the collegiate level, and even at the high school level. So you've been with athletes at all levels, and correct me if anything I say is incorrect, but you've worked with, you're the head strength conditioning coach at University of Massachusetts, uh, Tulane University, 
and also the head strength and conditioning coach for the New England Patriots. I don't know if anyone's heard of that team. I believe that's American football. Uh, yes. Is that correct, Omar? Never heard and of them. I asked my Canadian colleague. Never, never heard of them. Never yeah. heard of them. <laughs> so you worked, uh, Jan, you worked with them when they weren't winning, correct? Exactly. Or else I'd still be a witness when we didn't have a quarterback. If we had a quarterback, I'd still be there talking to you guys. <laughs> oh, the way the winds of time blow. That's and, amazing. Uh, and then let, let's see, uh, I think at the end of the 90s into the early 2000s, you worked with the Florida Panthers hockey team. Is that correct? I did. I did for four years, uh, 1998 to 2002. Yeah, that's was, awesome. that was a great experience. Uh, I was uh, I came down here looking for, well, I moved back out here from Arizona uh, with a preventive medicine company that I worked with out in Northwest Phoenix, uh, which was a real, really cool model. Uh, probably would have changed healthcare the way we know it today, but uh, as it was, it didn't work out. And uh, I started working with the Florida Panthers in 98. And uh, went through three different coaches and two owners, a lot like we wow. do in, in pro sports. But it was a great run. I love working with hockey players. I love working. Omar, Europe, and Canada, I understand, right? I am, absolutely. So home of hockey. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. That's, that's really interesting. You know, I, um, my, my entire uh, exposure to professional S&C has been either as a – personal trainer who focuses largely on working with strength athletes, um, which I did before I came out to New Zealand where I am now to doing my, my master's and my PhD in strength conditioning at Auckland university of technology, which it's a, uh, I'd say it's a leader in advanced education for S and C coaches, but it's interesting because almost all of my exposure has been outside of the U S. Um, so I work with, with, you know, alongside folks who are doing their PhD while they're the head strength conditioning coach for a rugby team or a, uh, in some cases, uh, sports that I never even heard of before, like cricket or netball. Um, and uh, I, I noticed the, the experience that they talk about and what I see them live is very much this kind of nomadic experience of following the team, uh, having to be very pragmatic in their, in their decision making, uh, very diplomatic in working with the, the coaches uh, and trying to find this balance between having their own life, but still being able to work with all these athletes. And I'm always just impressed with their ingenuity and their ability to make uh, good decisions in suboptimal environments. Um, would you say that that mirrors your experience in S&C, or is it different when you're, say, working with a, a traveling professional team versus the collegiate team versus, you know, a high school team? Uh, what, what is that experience of being an S&C coach? Uh, I think... Uh... It's. I, I took a different route. I think. I think I reached the professional ranks a little quicker than most do, and a lot of that is just timing. It's timing and and who you know. And when I was at the University of Massachusetts, I never really wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach. I actually was going to. Uh, I was taking prereqs for vet school. I was going to work with animals. My brother actually uh, drove and and uh, trained standard bred racehorses in New Jersey and uh, New York at the time. And I'm from New Jersey. So I did rounds with a vet for two months. When I graduated the University of Tennessee with my master's degree in exercise physiology, we took an advanced uh, animal physiology class at the vet school. It was one of the toughest classes I've ever taken. But it, it, it showed me that there was a place for a guy who knew strength and conditioning in the, uh, in the vet world. And to work mm. with race, race horses are amazing athletes. Uh, if you've ever been up and watching them and it's in the way that the uh, trainers work with them, very similar to where we work with athletes. And a lot of the philosophies we have with training athletes uh, simply uh, mirror or, or can filter into uh, training a, a four legged animal. But that being said, so I was taking some prereqs to try to go to vet school and uh, a friend of mine up at uh, Brown University, a track coach at the time, sent me this um, application for a job at UMass looking for a strength coach. And I said, look, I don't really want to be a coach. I, I never want to be a coach. I don't get paid a lot, blah, blah, blah. He said, look, the worst that can happen is you get uh, get some interview experience. So three interviews later, I got the job and I was there for four years. And and uh, I had the guy who hired me there, uh, Bob Stoll, went on to the University of Texas, El Paso. He took uh, one of my best friends with him. who was a great recruiter, coach with him uh, there. They were there, turned the program around two years, went to Missouri, coached there for two, uh, for four years. And at both places, they tried to hire me, and they didn't have enough money, and they were they were uh, uh, giving too many other responsibilities, like bringing up the turf or uh, breaking down films to a strength and conditioning coach now. 
So wow. it, it, to get to paint a little picture of not every place is, is perfect and not every place is purely strength and condition. There's so much politics that goes into every place you go to and you learn that. And so the, the next course of travel, there was the dean at the University of Massachusetts. His secretary was the mother of the guy who was now the athletic director at Tulane University. And his father was a legend in Massachusetts, played for the Giants at one time, was an athletic director at UMass. And uh, she asked me one day, she said, how'd you like to uh, coach at Tulane? I said, what are you kidding me? You're playing in the Superdome, Division One? Yeah, of course. So I went down there, took an interview, and I worked there for two years. And then when I looked after two years at, at jobs in the NFL, uh, the, uh, the Cleveland Browns had just opened up. They had just hired Bill Belichick to go coach at the Cleveland Browns, and that he had been in a program with a guy named Johnny Parker with the Giants, and Johnny Parker was primarily a, an Olympic lifting guy, and that's basically my background. All of my programs are pretty much based with uh, with power movements, and uh, I figured that would be a perfect match. Well, at the time, I didn't know anybody there. They hired the guy that was just fired by New England, who I pretty much, I don't like to say a lot of negative stuff, but I wouldn't give you a nickel for his programs. In fact, the head coach who hired me in New England had the guys do one lap around the stadium, and half of them didn't finish it. And he said, these guys are in terrible shape. He had he had this guy present his program to the coaching staff, and it was on three pieces of paper, I think it was, you know. This was an NFL strength coach. So long and short, he took the job. They hired him in, in, uh, in with Cleveland, and I had three people that I had known in, in New England through other people and so it's a matter of timing and knowing someone. Uh, it's and so the experience was great there. But the head coach there, uh, Dick McPherson, uh, was uh, 61 at the time. He brought in the entire defensive staff from the Denver Broncos, which it was just an unbelievable staff, a lot of experience. And uh, I mean, they'd gone to, I don't know, two, three, four Super Bowls there. They were fired because Dan Reeves there was about to lose his job and was told, look, you either get rid of some people or you're gone. And that's usually the case in the NFL. And usually when they cut somebody else, the head coach is the next one to get cut anyway. But so uh, long and short is politics, you know, politics. Mm. You know, I had experienced it in, in training, competing and, and now on a professional level. But it's it's we deal with that every day. You know, you hardly ever get a, a situation where everything is perfect. You know, I teach my kids in in school. They always ask about, you know, how do I do what you do? You know, how do I get to where you were and where you're at now? And. I said, it's just, it's just hard work timing. You got to pay your dues. You know, you just mm. have to keep working hard. You get educated, you get experience and then everything will fall into place. You know, you just have to, you have to keep moving forward. Um, but you know, you have to, as a strength and conditioning coach, whether it's college, whether it's high school, whether it's the pros to have a perfect scenario, which you hardly ever do. You have to have an athletic trainer who believes in your philosophies. You have to have an orthopedic surgeon who believes in the trainer believing in you you have to have a head coach who says, you know, I trust you guys, you with my players, because if you're not doing your job, then we're going to lose our jobs. You know, everything has to fit. And uh, you don't always get that. Even with the Florida Panthers, we were, it was the second coach I had there, uh, Dwayne Sutter, Dog Sutter. He was part of the four-year dynasty with the New York Islanders back in the 80s. He was the head coach. Uh, he was just named. And so my lip, my programs were the same as they were prior to then. Guys were powerful. They were as, as fit as anybody on the ice in the NHL. And we had one therapist that came in, a female therapist from the Cleveland Clinic at that time, who told the head coach that I don't really think that these Olympic lifts are good for the players. And but now she's never done an Olympic lift in her life, nor been under a weight period. Right. And then she's saying, oh, they're, they're too uh, they're too dangerous. So I had to give a three hour presentation to my coaching staff, to the general manager, to the owner of the team, which I had no problem doing, but basically debunking everything that she said was bad for players. In the meantime, I got all these euros that are coming in. All they're doing is Olympic lifting and they're the mm. fittest guys we have. Never had a groin injury, right? Never have back injuries and best athletes on the ice. And the guys from Russia coming in, uh, it's just Igor Larionov, one of the greatest hockey players of all time. First thing he does come into my weight room, starts doing power cleans. Right? Mm. Guy, guy weighed about 175 pounds soaking wet, right? But he's doing a it's amazing. So I, these are things that you learn across. And if you don't step into it, if you don't get your hands and your feet dirty, you'll never find out. You can't pick up in books. You can't learn about it in books, you know, which these mm -hmm. kids expect. The kids are a different, different climate out there with kids. But Yeah, it's, I think uh, it might be useful, given how you were just discussing 
how some of these things you can't learn in books if we really go into your initiation into the iron, uh, your background. So you began as an athlete before you even were considering a career as an S&C coach. Is that accurate? That's correct. That's correct. And out of high school, I played football uh, and I threw the shot. I was lucky enough to have something to lean back on. And so in high school, I threw 64 feet with a 12 pound shot and finished, I believe I was fifth, fifth at the nationals in, uh, uh, Sacramento was called the golden West meet in Sacramento, if they still had or not. And, uh, yeah, I really liked throwing a shot and discus. I threw a little of the javelin, uh, as well, but I enjoyed that the singularity of that, there is something about doing an individual sport. Lifting is the same thing. You're lifting your, you, it, it's up to you whether you compete well or not. And if you don't compete well, guess what? On the way home, the drive home, you better be thinking about what I did wrong and what I can do to better that, you know, and you can't wait to get back in the weight room again, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's volume, I have to put some more strength block in or whether I have to do some more explosive, whatever it is. But in, in a team sport, you know, you could say what you want about team sports and they're great as well for, for building uh, different characteristics of, of young kids. But you could have a shitty game and the other 10 guys do really well and you win the game. And then yeah. what do you do? You don't really care about bettering yourself because we have another win. You know, it takes a little bit of out. I believe that everybody should compete in an individual sport at some point in their lives, you know, whether they're in team sport or not. Um, but, yeah, that was that was a, a big part. My dad, as I said, was a professional soccer player. He was in the first professional soccer leagues here in the U.S. back in 1946 when Wrigley, the gum company guy in Chicago, started the first professional leagues. And there were only six teams, I believe, in the league. And my dad used to tell us when we were kids growing up, my brother and I, you know, he used to name every guy he knew. And they were they were mixed, all these ethnicities, because it was post-war, you know, and you had mm. a lot of people just immigrating here, but good soccer players. And Wrigley had the right idea at just the wrong time, you know. Eventually it started, you see where soccer is today. Uh, it only lasted a couple of years. Uh, but he took us, he used to he used to take us down the park. We used to play soccer once a, once a week probably, but he used to give us – baseball bat he used to give us a football whatever he wanted he was I, I thank him so much for exposing us to everything else even though soccer was his gig and uh my brother tried out as a kicker once on the team he played soccer one year and tried as a kicker so my dad said uh let me go down and help you out with kicking a ball so i never believe this or not he, my brother took a tee set up a tee down there put a ball on it my father said what is that thing for he said well pop you sit this this ball up here on this he goes well why put it on the ground he goes, no, Pop, you got to put it on this tee. This is how you kick it, right? Back then, everybody was kicking with the square toe, right? Everybody was kicking straight away. There was no soccer-style kick. Two guys started about that time was uh, Pete Gogolak and Jan Stenerud. Talk about another Jan, right? That's how you remember the name. But the two guys soccer-style, my father said, no, don't kick it with your toe. Kick it with your instep because this is where your power is and this is where your control is. My brother and I used to take everything with a half grain of salt with my dad because here he's a, an immigrant. And we you know we as kids, we didn't appreciate him so much. My dad kicked that football. He said, put it on that tee from, from the 50 yard line. Never, <laughs> never kicked a football in his life. And he put that thing through the goalposts and, and he thought nothing of it. My brother and I, we had our jaws dropped. I said, Pop, do you know what you just did? He said, I kicked that silly ball. <laughs> Pop, you just kicked 50 yards. You never touched it. He goes, you could be a professional. He goes, that, that, that's the professional nothing, you know? <laughs> he, it, he just made it so simple. But, it, you know, you look back now and you say everybody's kicking soccer style because that is truly control and power through that area. Um, mm. but, but football, I went to college at University of Rhode Island initially. After a year, I tore my posterior cruciate ligament. I had a heavy squat day one day, and then unfortunately I was refereeing a basketball game for a, a silly credit for one of my classes. And as I was backpedaling, they, they split these courts into three, and I was in the middle court, and the guy on the left side took an ace bandage off, threw it to my court, and I was backpedaling and rotated. My, my knee went into extension with rotation, and I snapped the PCL. It was an isolated case, but never had a repair. To this day, I still have it torn, but thank God that pushing off in the shot put, that was my block leg. I finally went to an orthopedic surgeon who said, look, if you don't play football anymore and try to get, you know, they used to cut me because I played a defensive end position. He said, get the quad strong and it'll pull the tibia forward. And he said, you're going to be okay. So I kept my legs real strong. And to this day, knock on wood, I, I don't have a PCL in that leg, but that launched me into, into uh, track and field. So I saw more of the world in track and field than I ever would have with football. 
and uh, went to Mer University of Maryland uh, three and a half years and uh, was lucky enough to, to be with some great athletes and some great coaches uh, at Maryland. But uh, Very cool. I, yeah, I love track. Track is a, in Europe, they call track athletics. Yep. You, have, you have everything in there, right? They pack stadiums there like they pack stadiums for football here because it's a circus of great athletes, jumping, running, throwing. You have all the elements of movement in that sport. And uh, I don't think we appreciate it as much here as we do because there's no money in it here, right? Everything's yeah, absolutely. Fun. It's something you, you, you likely did in high school, maybe did at the collegiate level, and then that kind of falls away. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to me how many of the roots of strength and conditioning typically come from people who largely worked with either weightlifters, uh, a little later, uh, powerlifters, and then a lot of track and field coaches. Uh, when yeah. you think about, you know, like Bondichuk or, or a, lot, a lot of the, the, the experts these days. Um, you know, we had Dan John on. Uh, Dan John just okay. recently, I think he turned early 60s. He threw in high school. Uh, all the way to collegiate, and he still does. He competes in Highland Games and and, and throws a, as a master's competitor and did weightlifting as a supplementary, uh, you know, uh, training to be a better thrower. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the roots of, of his strength conditioning philosophies. Um, how much would you say your experience in track and field uh, influenced your eventual programming that you would then institute when you got into uh, the, the, the position as a strength conditioning coach? Everything. Yeah, e everything I learned. I learned early on when I started throwing. Uh, the guy who taught me how to throw in high school was uh, this this guy named Wes Joyner in Bayonne, New Jersey, where Chuck Webner's from. You guys follow boxing at all, or have you ever seen the Rocky movies? It's it's old. Chuck Webner is the guy they used as the Rocky figure. The Stallone oh, okay. St Stallone watched him fight Muhammad Ali for fifteen rounds back in 1977 or 76, we as kids were in the movie theaters watching this close circuit. And it was amazing because uh, uh, Webner actually knocked Ali down at one point, but it was a kind of a technique where he stepped on his foot and threw a punch in, and Ali backed <laughs> away. And they called it a slip, but I, I met Angelo Dundee down here years later, who told me, he said, "Yon, that was no slip, he, he caught him. He knocked Ali down. And he was a, he's a liquor salesman from Bayonne, New Jersey. So that's where, Stallone got the idea for the movies. He was hmm. sitting in a hotel room in Cincinnati somewhere watching this fight and got the idea and the rest is history. And, and so, um, but to answer your question, everything came from track and field. I, I learned early on about periodization. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Bob Narcession, who was uh, uh, a friend of a friend and he was coaching at Brown track at the time. And Bob Narcession was a two time hammer champion in the sixties and brilliant when I say brilliant, brilliant guy, and uh, only had an undergraduate degree in mathematics, and he used numbers for everything. Mm. And and when I had, I struggled at, at Rhode Island a little bit with uh, staying in a circle. I tried to model myself. You talk about uh, uh, things coming to, to light or timing. I modeled myself after, after a guy named Al Feuerbach. And Al Feuerbach set the world record back in 1972, or 73 it was. And he was about my height, about 6'1". But he was a uh, AAU uh, senior champion in, in weightlifting. Wow. And one, one year he, he, uh, he went to York. He won the seniors at, in York, Pennsylvania, and then flew back to California and won the AAU championship for track in the shot put. I mean, he was an amazing athlete, right? That's he was impressive. The, he was the first little guy to beat uh, Randy Matson, who was a guy that stood from Texas, Texas A&M back then, to, stood about 6'6". Six, six. And he was 6'1", so it was like David and Goliath, you know. Uh, but but Bob Narcession, uh, I met with him uh, at the request of a friend of his, and he said, go up and see this guy. He said, he'll help you with, the, with your technique. And it was an apartment in Providence, Rhode Island, and he pulls out, he said, just wait here a second. He pulled out of the closet this, this fold-out of a sequence of a thrower from East Germany, a guy by the name of Harmut Brisnik. He was, and the title read, uh, Brisnik makes 70 foot easy, something to that effect. And they had this sequence, like they didn't have videos back then. They didn't, they had the 16 millimeters that you could watch, but it took forever to rewind it. And, uh, but he showed me the sequence and he said, look at this guy's technique. And back to that point, everybody in the U S was throwing a linear throw out of the back of the circle, meaning you take two steps, turn and throw. And usually the first step was a little bit longer step to get your foot rotated into the center of the circle underneath you. So it sat under the shot. And then it's all rotation and elevation from there. 
And he said, take a look at his right leg. Well, this guy kind of dragged his leg out of the back and put his foot down early, which meant that his base was much longer than ours. And he said, now watch how he gets to the left leg. And he said, look how he rifles. He doesn't even have to do a switch at the end with his feet. He just drives all of his momentum into his left leg, into the blocking leg. And I said, well, that's really good. But how tall is he, Bob? And he says, he's about 6'7". I said, Bob, if you haven't noticed, I'm 6'1". He, he looked at me and he said to me this, which I will never forget. He said, physics doesn't lie. And it doesn't. And the reason he was putting his leg down is the same reason all the Europeans practice putting their foot down first so they could apply a force faster. And not only do they apply a force faster, their foot is on, can't apply it when it's in the air. As soon as the foot's on the ground, now they're applying force. And that longer leg, that longer base, the longer step allows for greater impulse. And now they can apply that force to that shot for a longer period of time. Well, he showed me that and explained that to me. And we went outside and it was in the winter now. And we found this dry patch on the asphalt and thrown into the snow with the shot. And he said, try that. And he said, now, this is, this is how you get to the left leg. You rotate your left side. And with three throws, four throws, man, I was just throwing further than I ever had from a stand. And from that point on, then, he's, then he went over with me about periodization. And he said, this is the program. This is how you follow it. This is how you create your base. Then you move into the strength. Then you move into the power. And he said, and here will be your peaking cycle. And this is where your competition will be. It's the first time I learned it. I didn't learn it from any books. This guy taught, right? And then through time, of course, you start to develop different uh, ideas of your own, changing that a little bit, but keeping the same model. And that was just a linear model. Do you know that? And you guys, I know, are experts on the on undulating periodization. And, and uh, Mike does a tremendous job here with his research and all. But when I teach kids in class, whether it's undulating or what's linear, they're both linear models. Yeah. They, they both are following a linear path to success. And that's what mm -hmm. I tell these kids, you know, they all want the answers. They want, how do I get there? Well, man, you got, you got to, you got to train first of all, right? You got to, you got experience. Does it work or doesn't it work? You just can't say, I'll write it down with the pencil, these numbers here and this, it's, oh, it's not working for me. Well, yeah, because you're not sticking to it, you know, mm -hmm. but, but going back to your question, absolutely. Track and field is uh, my track coach in college was a guy by the name of Frank Costello at the University of Maryland. Very well-known track coach. He's written books on, on uh, plyometrics uh, with Don Chu out in California. He's known everybody, right? He's been around a long time. Was uh, also a national champ in, in uh, NCAA champ in the high jump back in the 60s. And uh, this guy went to, when he would compete in Russia, he competed against a guy named Valerie Bromel. And Valerie Bromel was a world record holder in the, in the high jump. This is when these guys were straddling now. They weren't doing the flop going over on their backs. They were straddling. Pre Fosbury, huh? Yes, pre Fosbury. That meant that their center of mass had to clear the bar. They weren't wow. they weren't cheating, if you will, physically, <laughs> right? I didn't call it cheating, but uh, this guy was the real deal. And he loved the throwing events, man, because he trained with with uh, at the time with Feuerbach. He trained with a guy named Brian Oldfield, who was a classic. A great guy passed away a couple of years ago. Real, he was the innovator for the rotational technique, which everybody uses today. Uh, and he was a character too. I'm trained with him. Uh, but Frank would teach me a lot about the mechanics of of all these different sports as I watched him coach. You know, during my tenure at Maryland for three and a half years, we had a guy by the name of Ronaldo Skeets Nehemiah came into Maryland from Scotch Plains, New Jersey. He set the world record in the high hurdles his first year as a freshman. Then he hit the weight room in the off season. Six world records his sophomore year. An amazing, wow. amazing athlete. And Frank used to say to me, you know what, Jan? Guess what? He says, ever since Skeets came here, now I'm the I'm the greatest hurdle coach in the world. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's that's another thing to take a look at. You know, who who makes the athlete? Is the coach makes the athlete or does the athlete make the coach? I will tell you that I think the athlete makes the coach. If you don't wow, screw them up. Right. <laughs> A lot of these coaches screw them up. They take a good thing in, even from a lifting standpoint, you know, you take a guy that's very strong, he's doing things a certain way. Technically, maybe he's he's just built to do it that way, right? I've known yeah. guys that have squatted ass to the floor for years. And uh, it's just the way they did things, right? And those are the guys that had the least amount of knee injuries because they started from a young age doing it that way. And all those joints and the connected tissues had adapted to that movement. Being that it's not way out of biomechanical realm, you know, but uh, it's interesting to watch. But uh, technique, technique and, and uh, 
track and field. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell the kids in class in biomechanics class that all movements related. I've coached uh, professional golfers down here, uh, and they'll, they'll ask me as I'm teaching them. They go, you know, when did where'd you learn how to play golf? I said I really never learned how to play golf. I said, but but watch me in this position in my shot. Look where my stand position is. And as I come out, rotate my left leg and my shoulders and the implements back here, look where your arms are now in this position. Lower body is leading everything, and it's a kinetic chain movement. Mm. I, I could match that with a baseball batter. I could do that with a baseball pitcher. It's all the same thing. It's wind and unwind, right? If you learn to, but you have to be strong enough to get to those positions on the bottom. The, the, the easiest part of, of, of a human's mobility is standing up, right? Mm. But it's being strong enough to get down and torqued. That's where you have to train, right? But it's, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah, I I, I really find, uh, I think that it's almost, uh, there's two potential ways it can go when I've seen weightlifting, powerlifting, or track and field coaches get into S&C. And the good ones do a really good job with it. And then some try to basically fit a, a, you know, a, a round ball into a square peg. So what I've seen is that, a good track and field coach or um, uh, weightlifting or powerlifting coach is someone who, because they get to focus on very few number of variables, and like you said, you know, an individual competition, you know you did a good job or not immediately. You can't rely on your team. You can't rely on other variables. Uh, you can't play poorly just against a poorer opponent and do well. Either you totaled more than you did last time, you threw further than the last time, or you didn't. Yep. So in some ways, uh, your, your flaws will be immediately exposed and a good athlete will then, uh, or a good coach will be able to identify that and try to drill, drill down to what variables need to be changed. So one thing I've seen kind of ubiquitously across those, those uh, different sports um, you know, from a coaching perspective is that they're really, really good at paying attention and making associations that make changes. Um, and I think that that is probably the key element that I've seen when uh, track and field coaches, weightlifting coaches, or powerlifting coaches are successful in, in, uh, when they go to S&C for a team sport. But when I see it not go well uh, is when they don't necessarily understand the principles behind what they're doing, and they just try to apply it one-to-one. -one. And there are some very obvious ways it doesn't fit, like a, you know, a Western linear model for a team sport athlete. You know, if you have to play a game once a week, you can't have a four month block of, of hypertrophy or something like that. Um, so I guess my question to you would be is, uh, and I, I sort of kind of primed it, uh, what, what aspects of what you learned from track and field and weightlifting were really useful? And then what things did you have to really adapt to the team sport environment so that they could transfer and be uh, skills of utility? I think that uh, one of the things you take a look at is, is, um, is, is everybody is different. Every, every individual is different. Every mind is different. And to try to get through to each individual or get through to a team as a whole is the wrong process. It's the wrong way to, to, to look at or even program. I learned early on that, that when you get into professional sports so much different than in college, you have a wide array of, of age groups. And you have mm -hmm. guys that are toward their end of their careers in hockey. I, I had guys that were into their 30s. Right. And now you guys that are 17 just coming in. Do they recover the same? Of course not. Have they been through different programs? Because in the pros now, they're traveling from team to team because of free agency and they're getting traded left and right. Strength coaches change sometimes every couple of years if they keep getting moved. That's a tough thing to do. Sometimes in this world today, when I got out, it was a little different. Now it's changed so much because everybody has their own strength and conditioning coach. And the mm -hmm. coaches I speak with now at the pro levels, they're up against it. Because they can give them the programs and they, they have their strength coaches, these, these uh, elite guys now who are making 10 times more than these guys will ever see. Although the strength and conditioning positions are getting paid a lot more today than they did years ago. And it's climbing. It's climbing. And so it, that's a good thing for strength and conditioning coaches. It's something to look forward to. But uh, having said that, they, they have to – they're responsible for these guys and their, their – uh, uh, not their competition, but their, uh, their performance, but they're pretty much caught in the middle because they're doing things at home that is not on the program written up for them. So it's kind of a, it's a hard position to be in from a strength conditioning side. And I could see where these guys kind of waver the guys that are up there now, and they'll kind of go with the flow a little bit or give a little bit. I could never do that. 
I, I think I probably wouldn't last very long in the pro level today because I, I have my ideas about training and I'm not about to sell myself to somebody because, you know, this guy here is making more money than me and he's our star player and, and his guy at home has him doing CrossFit and that he likes that. Let me like that. Today, there's more injuries in pro sports than there ever were before. And I think the place to look for the reason is the strength and conditioning. Because mm -hmm. when they go home, they're doing, they're doing years ago, you take a look at the old time uh, athletes, right? This is before they knew much about periodization or anything. Old, strong. I coached with a guy at New England by the name of Stan Jones. He's in the uh, NFL Hall of Fame. He played 12 years with George Hallis uh, with Chicago Bears, played his final year with, uh, uh, with the Washington Redskins. And he coached for, I don't know, 30 years. Another One of the first guys to lift in season in the NFL. And he was from a town in Pennsylvania. And he used to travel an hour and a half or two hours with his buddy drive to York Barbell. Huh. Wow. And watch the old guys lift. Yeah. Kid, yeah. Right? So his mind was set already. This is what I need to do in, when I start to play football. He played on the, one of the only national championship teams at Maryland, which is my alma mater. So we had a lot in common. And he was at New England. One of the reasons I... You know, I had a, a, an in trying to get in to get that job. But uh, but those guys back then, uh, they trained the, the specificity of training. You know, the conditioning was based about what their moving patterns were on the field. And they got into the lifting, heavier lifting squats. They where they did deadlifts. They did cleans back then, what they learned. But it's fascinating to sit and listen to a guy like that. Today, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't see much reason to push a truck or flip a tire or the, the transfer to a guy coming off of a line or trying to run down a, a, a running back. I, I don't see it. I see more injuries occurring with guys doing stuff that's out of their realm. And if you, if you stuck to the basics, and, and there was a guy by the name of, um, oh, God, what's his name now? Al Miller. Al Miller was a, a strength and conditioning coach for years in the NFL. Uh, he coached with the Denver Broncos. He actually started coaching in Louisiana, and then coach with uh, Bear Bryant at Alabama. He was his stre he was strength and conditioning coach there. We've been friends for years, and he came here with the Raiders a couple years ago. We had lunch, and he was always wondering about what's new in the science, Jan? What's new out there? What's, and he wanted to know what's the cutting-edge stuff. I said, well, you know, you know, different terms of periodization, the different modeling stuff. And at the end of our conversation, he said, you know what, Jan? He goes, the bottom line is it ain't that damn hard. <laughs> it ain't that damn hard. Stuff hadn't changed so much. And, and his point was that guys are coming in with all these different techniques and, and changing uh, exercises we did years ago a little bit. We do them on a stability ball. Do them on a, a cushion that's off balance or something. Uh, functional training, you know. Uh, what is functional training? We could go into a whole <laughs> deal on that, right? And there's so many functional gurus out there today that are writing books and doing videos and making money. But... Bottom line is, are they getting people stronger? Right. But they're not. You can't do that. You can't get somebody more powerful or stronger on a stability ball, guys, you know? It's it's just, it doesn't make any sense. So a lot of people, I think, today, they need education about about what to do and the right ways to do it. But, you know. John. Everybody's got an opinion, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, Jan, it's interesting how you connected everything where we've done some episodes on iron culture on the history of lifting, and we've spoken before about York Barbell, and it's important. When I went, uh, now it'd be almost two years ago to New York, we went to Mount Vernon to train, and I actually see that entire East Coast origin of lifting where it's the connection between strength and then also aesthetics, how someone looks where this town, this Mount Vernon uh, barbell that we went to, just old school iron. These individuals just absolutely crushing it. The work ethic where they just got off of a shift that worked. In fact, Mount Vernon barbell itself is a former factory that then they converted into uh, a gym. So you see kind of, as you said, the mindset of someone entering there. I think the question I'd have for you then, being a strength and conditioning coach for the last 30 plus years, what are some of the changes that you've seen? Either you could say positive, negative. What are some of the changes you've seen in the last 30 years in your field? Well, what I just mentioned is one. I, I think that we're getting, it's kind of got diluted. We, we started this thing out about when I was with the NSCA. NSCA was started with strength coaches. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take a look at the, the, uh, the management side of it or the, the strength side of it, there are less and less strength coaches and they're more physical therapists, they're more personal trainers, they're more uh, a little bit of anything. It's becoming more of a business thing. I, I wrote an article when I was at 
uh, University of Tennessee years ago, uh, and I was a graduate assistant there, and I wrote an article, and I submitted it, and it was turned down by the NSC in their journal. And the reason was, <clears throat> and the article was basically machines versus free weights. Remember that argument years ago? Machines versus free weights. Get turned down. You know why I get turned down? Because they had so many uh, advertisers that were machine companies that had nothing to do with the philosophy. What was better, what was worse? And that was my first real picture of, you know, it's all about money. It's all about money today. So, you know, uh, as far as the changes go, I think supplements have had a big role in that. I think uh, programming has had a big role in it. I, and I think it's just, this is just, a, it's a new age right now. You know, I, I uh, Mike, Mike and I talk about this all the time. I talk about him in class because he's a cutting edge guy. And you have to, and, and some of the NSCA, and I know he's met some, resistance, if you will, from the NSCA, some of the researchers and things, the so-called researchers, they're locked into the old methodologies. And you know what? It, they may still work, right? But who says something else doesn't work better? And mm -hmm. so when Mike starts to explain to me more about what he's been doing, when I first met him here, I found him very interesting because he's the kind of guy like he's like the Chuck Yeager of lifting, right? He's the guy who's going to get into anything, try anything uh, against the grain. He'll, he'll, Jaeger used to get into planes that they could barely get off the ground, but if the guy told him, this got a shot at breaking the sound barrier, I'll take it, you know, load it up. Hmm. If it weren't for those test pilots, we wouldn't have a NASA program. So if it's not for guys like you and, and, uh, and Zordos here, who knows what we're missing out on, right? You got to try things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I told him I still have questions about doing what he's doing on a body like mine of 63 years of age with all these orthopedic issues. It's a whole different story. But you can adapt, I think, you know, and, and if it works here, try different. That's what research is about. And that's what he's doing a great job of here. But I think uh, yeah, I think also what I see in strength conditioning uh, from an, a not so happy side is you get a lot of these guys getting hired in colleges that are just their cheerleaders. Head coaches, football coaches especially, will hire them because they are they come off as if they're the wardens and they need a warden here. I need somebody to run rough shot on these guys. I don't want to see them, you know, get up off the ground. I want their tongues hanging. I want you to be in their face. And I see more and more of that and less and less of pure strength and conditioning, you know. I mean, I could never – guys respected me that I worked with. And, and I never – first thing I would tell them when I went to the NFL – uh, a lot of guys would say to me, you know, wh wh why do you want to do that? I said, why not? It's the NFL. Are you kidding me? Oh, those guys are getting paid much more than you. They're going to tell you what to do. So I went in a little bit defensive, but not letting anybody know. And what I found out was if, if you could teach anybody or tell anybody or show anybody that you can make them better in the pro levels to make another contract, to get another contract year or two years or three years at, they'll do whatever you ask them to do. So the first thing I would say to them is, I'll never ask you to do anything I can't do myself. So in the NFL, sure enough, they had to clean that, squat that, <laughs> jerk that. <laughs> uh, they had me do everything, right? <laughs> Jump that because I promised them, right? And at that point, I could do all that stuff. Uh, but I think today, I, I think the, the the pure strength coach, the smart strength coach, they have a tougher time getting jobs if they're not a rah-rah guy. Mm. I really believe that. And that's uh, it's sad to see that, but – that's the way it is. The, the players are different today, right? The players today have less passion for the game. They have more passion for the dollar. You know, look at what's going on in California with them. Gonna, they're going to pay guys now to play out there because they have endorsements and they're going to pay them because it's yeah, granted the universities are making money on them. But what's that going to turn into? If you start, mm. uh, if you have another system where you perhaps you have the money put into a trust fund or some type of pool, where they'll only get paid if they get their degree, or at their certain age of twenty one. Now do that. I'm okay with that, but don't give them all this money up front. Everybody, it just opens up a Pandora's box, and NCAA is not going to start paying everybody. It's just crazy, you know. It's a different world, you know. I, when I was with the um, Patriots. The last year I was there, we I met a lot of these older guys like John Hanna, who's in the Hall of Fame, who was an offensive lineman, and uh, uh, many of the other players. And they would, to the man, they would say to me, "You know, yeah, we would have played this game for nothing." Just a yeah. different. They love the game of football, man. Just like uh, the guys that are lifting weights, they don't love it for money. They love it for the pure sport of lifting more weight, you know. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what I loved about track and field. I trained with some of the best throwers in the world. The Feuerbach, I trained with Mac Wilkins. They're close friends of mine. Wilkins was a gold medalist in 76 in Montreal. Al Feuerbach was on three Olympic teams. Uh, these guys just did it for the passion, you know. And everybody was, we'd go to a meet and uh, everybody kind of root everybody else on to do well. It was It was an interesting environment, you know. Just every, it was all about throwing far. What can you do to throw further? And you, you look at it, you know, it's a stupid ball, 16 pound ball, but it was, and these bunch of big guys throwing to see who can throw further, you know, it's wild. But it's there's certain passion about that, that uh, in the training aspect of it, to get yourself prepared for that competition was awesome. You know, that's what you miss when the football players talk about it. I miss the camaraderie of it when they're done with their, their game. That's what it is, you know, but it's the pure, it's a competition. It's getting your body ready mentally, physically, and spiritually to some point for the greatest moment of your life. And you'll never forget them, you know? I, I, uh, I, the, what, what you just said speaks to the entire uh, ethos of, of, of me as a lifter, you know, having competed in uh, weightlifting, powerlifting, uh, even drug free bodybuilding, and also now strongman. They're ridiculous things we do, you know. I, I, uh, I pick things up, I put them down, I throw them over my head, I do competitive starvation for personal growth, <laughs> flex in, 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 a, in a speedo, and you know lay on, lay on a bench, press things up, and occasionally get injured doing so, and it is by far the largest passion <laughs> of my life. Um, and that is what you know the iron culture is about. Um, and I think that's it's, it's such a strange and, and yet beautiful thing. So I, I would love to hear um, more about your, when you were in the thick of it as a thrower, and you, like you said, you were, uh, your, your whole focus, you said even spiritually, was towards throwing shot. How far did you take it? How far could you take it? And, and what uh, eventually led to you not being a competitive thrower anymore? Well, in, in uh, 84, well, 80, I competed in the trials in 80 and in 84. And in 80, I was just out of college. I graduated Maryland in uh, 79. Uh, I competed. I was a three-time All-American. I competed at the AAU meet in uh, 79. And then it was just a matter of what am I going to do for 1980? And I was mm. really starting to get better at throwing. Al Feuerbach actually took part in a USA-USSR meet, dual meet, at College Park, Maryland one year in 79. And my coach who knew him, Frank Costello, introduced me to him. And I, man, I was tickled pink to be able to see him and just talk to him one-on-one and and he had watched me throw, and I actually threw at the uh, Bruce Jenner Track Classic, which was in San Jose, which which is where those guys lived and trained at. That was the mecca of throwers. And uh, and at that time, I probably wouldn't have gotten into the meet if it weren't for Skeets Nehemiah. And usually the meet directors would call Frank Costello up and say, you know, so uh, what's it going to take to get Skeets Nehemiah out to our meet? Because he was the drawing card and always had an opportunity to break the world record on top of it. And so he said, well, I'll bring skeets out, but you got to take uh, Brian Melly, my All-American high jumper. you got to take uh, uh, Ivory, my long jumper. you got to take uh, uh, Jan Picka, my, my shot putter. And so he put together five or six of us, and the guy goes, it's done, you know. So we got to compete out there. And so Al knew of my technique. He watched me throw. He, he saw that I was doing something different than all the other American throwers because I was kind of that East German flavor. And he had trained in East Germany with a guy named uh, West Germany with a guy named uh, Christian Gehrman, who was a really good coach. He trained both Mac and he uh, when they were in Europe. And so he said, you know, uh, what are you going to do for next year? You're going to compete. I said, yeah, I want to make that Olympic team. So he said, uh, you got a place to train. And I said, well, no, not right. He goes, would you like to train with me? I like, almost fell over. And we were about the same size. We both had Olympic lifting philosophy in there. Uh, he knew guys that I knew in Olympic lifting. And um, I think he just wanted, he knew my passion for throwing and he needed somebody to train with. So I actually moved in with him. Mm-hmm. I lived with him that whole year uh, before the 80 trials. And uh, Mac Wilkins was living with him and then he moved out. Uh, he got married, moved down the hill to uh, Soquel. Uh, but we were up in the mountains. It was, it was in a place called Los Gatos. Los Gatos. And he had a house that he built in the woods and it was on this hill. And uh, if you saw a picture of it, um, his carport, we converted to a weight room and we used rail. We used railroad ties for these uh, for the uh, uh, the the stand for the uh, squat rack. We drilled holes and we just used these big pins to put in it for an incline. We did inclines. We did squats. We did Olympic lifts, had a platform. It was just a great setup. 
Um, and so we trained together in, uh, in 80, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was it? What was the initial question? You got me going on, yeah, on just, training here. Well, that's, that's awesome. It's uh, basically, uh, how far did you take oh, uh, oh. throwing and then, so, and then when did you stop? Yeah. So, so 80, uh, 80 trials, it was about a month. It was about five weeks or six weeks. Al used to like to throw and then get a lift in. He used to mm-hmm. lift and throw every day. And he used to uh, alternate his lifts. Me, I was I was a guy, a kind of guy who I could throw maybe twice a week and then compete. I, I couldn't train as much as these other guys. Everybody's different, and so I, I lifted three days a week. And getting closer to the trials, we were five or six weeks out. And I remember I uh, I had the I had the best training session. I think I threw 64, 64 six or something in training that day with him. Went into the weight room and he was doing some clean, so I cleaned with him. And and being that I had that I have posterior cruciate ligament, I told you my left knee, I could not go into a full squat clean. So I used to power clean and jerk in the meets. And uh, and I so I I caught this weight. It was a three thirty three thirty three or whatever it was. And I took it down to kind of a half squat, and my elbow touched my knee which threw my wrist into a hyperextended position, my throwing wrist of all things. So I thought I'd broken it. This is six weeks from the trials. And I imagine all this time training for the Olympic trials, and now you have, the, I can't even move the wrist. Had it x-rayed, there was no break. So it was just, and Al would be such a positive guy. He was amazing, positive nature. And he would say, look, it's time to just get everything stronger, right? You don't have to do this, don't throw, but get the rest of your body, good, Good time to get your legs stronger, he'd say, right? And so after a while, it was about seven days or so, I got this uh, this wrist brace, this leather brace from another thrower, strapped it on, started throwing a like a four-pound shot, six-pound shot, and I started moving my way up. And I worked my way to the trials, and I was the only guy at the trials with a with a with a PR at the time, it was 6610, almost 67 feet. Wow. But I finished fifth. Right. I had an alternate spot. Oldfield finished ahead of me in fourth, but he was ineligible because he was a pro athlete at one time. They let him throw anyway. So I had the cleanup spot, if you will, or the alternate spot. But I was the only one with a PR because I was the only one really, I think, periodized correctly and and peaked. But had the wrist not gone, I think I could have thrown 70 feet that day. So that kept me going for another four years. And then uh, in 84, I got to school at, uh, at Tennessee, got my master's degree. And the focus, I didn't have that eye of the tiger I had in 80. You know, mm-hmm. I finished seventh at the trials that year in, in L.A. And uh, it was a great experience to be there. But it just it just wasn't there. So I said that, you know, that's it. Let's go on with life now. But I got to tell you something. That year to follow, I went back to finish up my uh, uh, my degree. I had to do a data collection and defend my thesis at Tennessee in in uh, eighty five, and uh, I was lost in the weight room for a year. And when I tell you that, I would walk into the weight room and not know what to do, mm. and it, it scared the shit out of me. It really did. And I called Al up and said, Al, I'm going through this thing, and I said, I don't know what it is. And he started chuckling. I said, what are you laughing at? I said, I'm serious. He goes, Jan, I went through the same thing when I retired in 84. He said, all it is, it's a mental, it's a loss. You're in kind of a vacuum because you've trained for something so passionately and something with great intensity for so long. And now you don't have that to reach for anymore. So I said, what did you do? He said, well, I I just, I took what the way we used to train when we got up in the morning and we had a big breakfast and we would do a workout and and, you know, and then we train harder in the afternoon and then we chill out at night, whatever it was. He goes, I do that with my work now. So once I started to apply all the principles of training now to work or school or whatever it was I was doing, it, it had meaning to it again. Right. And going into a mm-hmm. weight room now became fun because I knew I didn't have to lift those heavy weights anymore. I didn't have a goal, but I set different goals now. You know, and I think without setting goals for yourself, you you're lost like that. I think most people yes. are, you know, oh, yeah. and that's it. There's there's a difference between training and working out. Right. I think I work out more now than I train. <laughs> yeah. Train. You have to have focus. You have to have a goal to reach for. And uh, most people just work out. They call it training, but it's not training. That uh, absolutely that resonates uh, immensely with the iron culture, because, uh, Jan, we have a lot of individuals and I actually know quite a few that one of our chosen sports is powerlifting and they'll send to a certain level of either competition and they'll achieve a certain amount of goals, they'll either win and then they find it hard 
to attain even higher achievements. And so then they struggle with their identity or maybe for whatever reason, they might incur an injury or or what have you. And so their identity of being a highly competitive athlete gets taken away from them. And I actually know quite a few of them who have pretty much just quit lifting. So they go from being these ultra dedicated individuals that are training five or six times a week, 12 hours a week in total, uh, just dead on it, getting their sleep, their life revolves around their professional athletic development. And then once that fire, as you said, so to speak, is taken away from them, they're completely lost. And I think we try on Iron Culture to talk a lot about the concept of transferring some of the skills in the weight room to other aspects of your life. So it's nice to hear you echoing that, the exact same concept of you, you say, as you'd get up in uh, the morning, kind of with fire in your stomach to go ahead and train, applying that to other areas, such as your work in school and whatever the other situation might be, how important it is. Because unfortunately, what we sometimes see in the weight room are individuals that will be absolutely focused. They adhere to their program, but then none of that bleeds over to other aspects of their life. So it's almost like in this vacuum where they know how to do everything in this one field lifting and none of it applies over to other areas of their life. So very interesting. Yeah, I think you have to when you take a look at what it takes to uh, to be a good lifter. Uh, or a good competitor, there's so many different characteristics within that you get lost because you're in the bubble. When you're outside of the bubble, look, as, as, for instance, uh, the Olympic trials, everybody gave me all these congratulations. Right? You made the, you're an alternate. I said, and you felt like shit because you didn't make a team, number one. Number two, even if you had gone, you're not going anywhere. Right? That yeah. was the worst. That was the, the other bullet in the head, right? So, you know, here's a team that you, you, you spend all this time, the guys that made this team or the gals that made the team, and now you, you can't go to, to what you've trained so hard for for all these years. Uh, but there's those characteristics when you take a look at them and you, you come outside the bubble looking in. There's so many of those that you can use in life, and you're so far ahead of everybody else out there. Just the fact that you could drag that lazy, I say lazy, tired, body of yours after most people work during the day into a weight room or into a gym to get a workout in it takes so much effort it takes so much focus it takes so much determination and all you have to do is take a piece of that and and now transfer it into some other part of your life and you're way ahead of the game but we lose Mm -hmm. sight of that because we're so we're so locked up in the competition we're so locked up into numbers if you will and hitting our lifts and hitting our percentages and and getting certain totals and you lose sight of what it is that that it's the journey right the culture like you guys talk about it's that's what that's the best part of it though and sometimes we we look at it too far down the road you know at my stage of the game now when i look back i can't realize how many years have gone by and where those years go and I could still, when I, I love to ask people what they, you know, they, oh, I track and field. I used to run. I said, well, what'd you run? Oh, I used to run a one and two. I said, great. What were your times? Oh, I don't really remember. I said, well, then you didn't run. <laughs> I can, you guys should be able to remember every total uh-huh. you had and every meet you had, the ones that you did well, the ones that you didn't, you, you just do. If you have a passion mm-hmm. for it, I could remember oh, yeah. every, every meet I threw in. I can remember the perfect throws that felt like nothing. Right. It felt like I didn't use a muscle in my body because everything was synchronized perfectly. And I remember the ones that I had to struggle through where the throwers uh, chant used to be when in doubt, power out. You know, when technique's not there for whatever reason, (laughs) just throw you throw the shit out of it, you know. But Mm -hmm. those are the things I think that that we need to take away from that. And you have to be in it long enough to realize, you know, what it takes. And uh, there's so many great qualities in, in, in training, you know. Those guys that we talked about back in York, Pennsylvania, one of the guys that taught me how to Olympic lift is a guy named Mark Cameron. Mark Cameron was one of, I want to say, four or five people in the history of the U.S. to clean and jerk over 500 pounds. He did it at 238. He did 501. He did it in uh, Allentown, PA, back in 1979. But tremendous technician. And he learned from a guy named Joe Mills, who was a legend. You talk about, he's like the, the Mickey in the Rocky movie. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so uh, uh, unorthodox and everything he did, but the stuff worked, you know, like catch the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy had a setup in uh, in Central Falls, Massachusetts, Central Falls. And he had a small shack and he had a, a little chair. He had a platform. He had some uh, I don't even know if they had bumpers back then as a seal plates. He had a little fridge where he had all his beers and he smoked a cigarette. That was, and he was one of the greatest coaches of the U.S. in in Olympic weightlifting. He coached Al Stark. He called he coached the great Bob Bednarski, senior oh. champion, world record holder. Right? I, I mean, it's amazing. So Cameron taught me how to 
do the pulls really and taught me how to do the lifts when I started out. And uh, at his wedding, you had uh, John Grimmick. You guys know the great John Grimmick, right? Oh, Eric 100%. is excited now. Grimmick's one of his heroes. <laughs> Grimmick, Grimmick. When I met Grimmick, he was probably shit, probably eighty years old, seventy nine. Danced the polka with his wife at Cameron's wedding, and still had the nicest guy in the world. Looked like he could have lasted another hundred years. But those are the old school guys that you know did the bodybuilding, they did the lifting, they did everything. You know, um, you just I mean you just learn from the guys, the older guys. That uh, history is everything, right? If we don't know mm. about the past, how are we going to move through to the future? And I think that's the biggest part that we lose. I think maybe in in strength and conditioning is uh, is how did those guys do it back then? You know, they had a lot of they didn't have all the equipment, they didn't have the nutrition we had, but boy, they worked their asses off and they did whatever did whatever worked for them. That's what they did. Cool stuff, you know. Hundred percent. I, I think one of the I um I always try to emphasize the importance of history without saying that we should be you know you know luddites. Like I I love uh, that you were talking about how uh, you know Doctor Zerdos is someone who is very intriguing because he's constantly trying to push the envelope, trying new things. He's he's a true researcher, he's experimenting. He's he's willing to buck the assumptions. Um, yet you also respect guys like John Grimmick, and I think. There are two distinct lessons to learn there, and 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 from my perspective, uh, the lesson to learn from history is not that we need to do what they did, but rather there is so much to be learned from folks who are in a position where they have less influences and just have to figure it out. You Agreed. know, the the average eighteen year old who becomes a trainer today, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, has so many preconceived notions of what they have to do or supposed to do or what is done depending on what social media they've been exposed to, what, uh, you know, you know who, who influenced them, what they see. And there's this constant stream of information where many times it supplants their actual ability to just trial and error, uh, observe, and see what, what happens. And I think there was a certain uh, utility in the anecdotes that came out of history when you would see two disparate groups on different parts of the world, different parts of the country, who had no contact with each other, and when they would stumble upon, quote unquote, similar ideas, there's a higher probability that that's actually something useful that can be taken away. And I think some of the, the patterns that uh, weightlifters fell into in, in the pre-internet age, um, I think there's, there's a lot to be learned there. It's something interesting when I noticed, man, all these guys trained, not in the same way, but there were certain elements that were kind of traced through. And uh, Omar and I just talked about uh, training frequency and how uh, there was a time point uh, when, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting, Olympic weightlifting were kind of all one and the same, where pretty much everybody was training, uh, you know, full body or upper lower. And uh, and then how we, we, once more variables came into the mix, be that anabolic steroids, machines, high intensity interval training, isometrics. Now, all of a sudden, the, the types of training that you saw in the iron game just became just this many different approaches. Um, and I, I think, uh, some of that is, is purely because of confusion, uh, as there's so many more variables to manage. So I think there's, there's a lot of value in looking at history from that lens personally. Well, we said, uh, and that confusion reminds me of, uh, we, we used to be taught muscle memory, right? You teach the muscle the muscle's going to remember what it had done at one time. Now you look at what they teach today, muscle confusion, right? Confuse <laughs> the muscle because you don't want the muscle to remember what it did five minutes ago. And I look at these, I think the biggest problem, and, and this is off this true strength side, but I look at these personal trainers today, right? And most of them are certified overnight. They were bartenders yesterday. They're certified personal trainers today. And they're training people for a ton of money. People have no idea who they're training with, what type of training they know. But the stuff that they're doing out there, I can't, I can hardly work out and watch that stuff because it makes me sick. And, mm. you know, I trained because we have a cryotherapy business down here uh, across from not far from the university here. We've had for two years. Um, I work out in a place that has about 4000 members right across the street. And it's an upper end. It's almost like a it's a huge place. It's called Lifetime Fitness. Mm. And I, they must have 30 trainers in there. Three or four of them are my former students. So they always watch over their shoulder when they're training <laughs> clients because they know I'm watching them. But uh, the stuff that they pull up there in the, the, uh, the, uh, business itself tells these kids or their trainers, the first rule of law for trainers is, uh, 
uh, entertain your client. Mm -hmm. And so they're entertaining them at the cost of maybe hurting them, which most times they put them in a biomechanically poor position. Uh, but it's crazy. And with all the literature out there and knowledge out there, you know, these certi there's too many certifications that, that aren't, that don't hold their weight, you know? And, uh, but from a strength and conditioning standpoint, I think, uh, we have the certifications out there, but I tell the kids, you can get certified and still not know what you're doing. So you have to have experience. You have to have some type of scientific basis for what you're doing. Uh, and, and you have to live it. I think the third part is you see so many people out there that are they're They're just they look like they're out of shape, but they're personal trainers. Right. They look like Humpty Dumpty and uh, mm. and how they're training people. I have no idea. But uh, but anyway, I digress. <laughs> Well, Jan, let me ask you this question then, because it, it is true that in this day and age, the barrier to entry is quite low. And as someone like uh, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld would say, in a industry that has no regulation, you kind of have to self-regulate via uh, trying to identify things that are important, pass it down. The whole concept of mentorship I see from you and what you've talked about being very important. It's someone that taught you how to properly do Olympic lifting, someone who first taught you how to periodize training, where these are opportunities that you uh, have had. Um, and then I, I do see individuals, well now, the former asymmetry of knowledge where you had to go to school to learn some of these things, someone could look something up online, think that Dunning-Kruger effect that they're they now have all the answers. And so they enter either the workforce or they have that one size fits all approach where I know what you mean. The uh, gym that I go to, I would say, Sean is fantastic. And he picks really good trainers. He makes sure whoever works there, he's a, he's an old school strength and uh, conditioning guy knows what they're talking about. But when you visit other gyms, I've actually noticed, and I shared the story of this trainer who had three, I was training for two and a half hours, just, you know, doing a normal session and he had three different clients and the three clients were completely different individuals. So one, they're all females, but one was older, one was uh, more overweight, higher BMI, and one was younger and quite athletic. And for me, just being in the same kind of squat rack, doing my training and having a bird's eye view of everything, I managed to see how he trains three clients. And this individual, interesting enough, I found out uh, since is someone who's ranked, they have the blog websites and whatnot. I think he's in Toronto's top 10 personal trainers, but he's kind of like what you are saying, where he's a little bit of a cheerleader with the idea that he's yelling in their face, like, come on, you could do like five more. But every single client had the exact same routine, different training experiences, likely slightly different goals. Um, but these individuals are given the exact same routine. So I think the question that I would ask you would be what are some of the most important qualities for a strength and conditioning coach? What would you say are from your experience you you emphasize and I like that the practical component where you need to live it, you need to breathe it, mentorship. What when you take a look at strength and conditioning, what are some of the most important qualities for a good SNC coach? I think you have to have an education, you know, and 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 I will go out on a limb to say that I would take a a good master's degree over any certification. If if you're in a right program for strength and conditioning, I would take that. You know, you don't have to get certified, but you have to have some kind of certification today, a piece of paper, but you, you truly have to know what you're doing. So education is one. The practical experience, it, it goes without saying. You can pull out of a book whatever you want. You could take uh, videos, whatever you want. If you can't do it yourself and understand why you're doing it, and like you said, you uh, uh, talked about, Eric talked about earlier, the uh, fitting the square peg in the round hole or vice versa. You can't force certain movements or certain uh, programs on people that, that can't do them. And every individual is different. And I've seen that what you're explaining, Omar, I've seen it, I see it every day. They, they do, I call it the shotgun approach, right? Where this, this uh, trainer may in the morning go through a workout that he saw on a video last night. He practices it as a, uh, himself, some kind of functional movements. And then he'll do 10 clients and every uh, one of the 10 clients does the same workout with him all day. So he's trying something different with everybody. And, and look, it may not be for everybody. And I've seen people get hurt doing that. And uh, then they don't have a client in that slot and they have to fill somebody else in the next week. Right. So I would think personal experience, the scientific aspect of it uh, for certain. Uh, uh, and uh, geez, I don't know. It, I think the experience... Uh, has a big role, uh, the science, the experience, 
there was one other thing. I guess the right the right certification, I guess, or degree, and that comes with the science background. Uh, but it never hurts to. I see so many uh, personal trainers out there, or strength and conditioning coaches that were were maybe bodybuilders at one time. And bodybuilders, to me, I have a, a guy named Mike Ashley, who's a dear friend of mine, was Mr. World and Mr. Universe, lives down here as a private training business, dear friend of mine. And uh, he, I love the guy because when we were back in Maryland years ago and, and uh, Cameron and I used to work out at this gym, which was you know, half of it was an aquatics a dive shop. The other half was a strength, a strength conditioning or a gym, <laughs> old, old school gym in Maryland. And we had guys down there. You remember the Menser brothers, Mike Menser, mm -hmm. if you remember bodybuilders, they down, there. down here at this place. We had bodybuilders, we had powerlifters, of course, we had Olympic lifters, and we used to, everybody got along great, but everybody busted everybody's balls every time we were in there. And we always had the saying that uh, powerlifters hated uh, uh, Olympic lifters, Olympic lifters hated powerlifters, but both of them hated bodybuilders. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of the joke down there all the time. Everybody had a good time and trained together, but uh, I think that uh, when you take a look at these, uh, I, I just... You, you take a look at these trainers, they have to be, they have to be uh, into what they're doing. And so many times they're not, they just, it's a job to them. It's just to make a couple bucks. And, and you and I, with the three of us have passion for this, right? So you have to have a passion for what you're doing. Um, I think from a, from a business model, none of us really have a good business model when we start out. And we, we, we come in from a pure aspect of getting stronger or training people. Uh, I don't know how many times when I was just getting into the business out of schoolers, I'd see people in the gym and help them out, uh, forego my workout, help them out. And I would just give everything away for free. And after a while, I'm watching all these other people making money doing this. And I'm going, what am I doing? What are you, an idiot in here, right? Uh, but I think that you have to you have to have a passion for what you're doing, no matter what you do. You know, when I was with the Patriots one time, a guy named Dante Scarnecchi, who still coaches with their team, offensive line coach with the Pats after all these years, uh, we were showering up, getting ready to leave. And I said to him, I said, you know, Dante, I wish one of these days I could get a, a nine to five job where I just put a suit on and I'll come into work in the morning, go home. And he goes, are you kidding me? He goes, let me tell you something. Guys like you, he goes, I don't care what job you have. You're going to spend all the time you have to do to get the job done right. And so it comes down to if you're doing it, if you're passionate about lifting, you're going to be passionate about your work or vice versa. You know, it's just it's something built into you. Uh, there's a guy that I worked with, the largest Harley Davidson dealer in the world a few years ago named Bruce Rossmeyer, who's my only client. And a doctor, an orthopedic friend of mine put us together and I actually was, he was my only client for two years. I traveled everywhere with this guy. And this guy weighed 380 pounds when I started, about my height, half an inch taller. He was bone on bone in his knees. Great guy, self-made millionaire, but he was going to die if he didn't do something about his weight and, and fitness. So we started working together. He lost uh, 100 pounds in seven months. I went into the uh, OR with him, watched him get his knee replaced. We did the rehab with him. And when I started, you know, you, you ask these guys, the questionnaires, the typical questions, do you smoke? Do you drink? You know, uh, how much do you smoke? How much do you drink? Well, when I asked this guy, he, he wrote down a piece of paper on the, uh, the questionnaire. He said, uh, uh, one, one and a half to two. So as I'm reading this to him, I'm going, OK, no smoking, no caffeine, no drinks. One and a half to two. That's really not bad, Bruce. And he'd say to me, no, you don't understand, Jan. He said, that's bottles. <laughs> I said, what? Oh, bottles. Bottles. And so my first thought was he's an alcoholic. And so I said to him, I said, Bruce, I said, if we're going to do this thing, I said, no more drinking, period. I said, if you have one sip, it's over, right? It's all or nothing. And he was a gambler, so he, he used to push all in. He said, look, I'm okay with that. And the guy cut cold that day, and that was one of the reasons for him losing that kind of weight in seven months. We trained hard. We trained twice a, twice a day uh, and put him on a program and a plan to get there. But it taught me something about he was so successful in business, he had a mindset for that. He applied that mindset to losing weight and getting fit. So if you have it in there for training, you could have it in there for anything else or vice versa, right? So we talk about that transfer, the stuff that we have inside that it's not the end all if I stop training. Take those characteristics that drove you into training and being successful, apply them to something else. And you find your, you find your same success, but just in a different realm of life, you know? I love it. I think uh, you highlighted so many important things there. You know, the the uh, the emphasis on not only 
uh, you know, scientific understanding of principles, but also experience, which I think a lot of people put almost in opposition. But I think you really highlighted how well they go hand in hand and all of that uh, underpinning by passion. And then again, circling back to just how important it is to to take the lessons that you either learn from the iron game and apply it to life or like that individual did who took what they learned from business and applied it to the iron game. I think understanding that uh, every every purposeful challenge we put ourselves through can be a microcosm for life, whether you're hoisting iron or whether you're trying to make a, a business not fail, which most businesses initially do fail. And I think that that's just really cool that you brought that up. Um, I also love that you mentioned Mike Ashley. I met you know, Mike? Uh, Mike Ashley. I do. I, 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 I met him and was absolutely f- floored that I got to meet him at, uh, I think it was the 2016 NSCA National Conference. So for those who don't know, Mike Ashley um, won the Arnold Classic in 1990. Yep. Uh, and he was he's a very successful bodybuilder. And I say that because, and I, I do believe this, that he's a natural bodybuilder, but he made it to the IFBB pro ranks and, and competed in the 80s and 90s and struggled. And the one time he did really well and won the 1990 Arnold Classic, guess what they did that year? That was the year they actually drug tested the Arnold Classic and they implemented drug testing. I think this was shortly after a few IFBB pros had died from diuretic usage. So they were trying to uh, you know, safeguard the athletes, clean up the sport. It didn't last. But when every other IFBB pro in the, uh, and I think that year in the Arnold Classic looked way worse, Mike Ash looked the same and, <laughs> and was rewarded for it. So, um, yeah, I met the guy. And, and what really impressed me is that I want to say Mike Ashley is in his – uh, I don't. I don't want to overage him, but I think he's in his late fifties now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, you're really, you're really close. I think he's close to sixty, fifty nine or sixty right now. Yeah. Yeah, and and when I met him at 2016, he he uh, we we met. There's a it, when you go to the NSCA National Conference for the listeners, there are special interest groups. There's SIGs, so they have these different special interest groups depending on what your academic area is. And so there is a bodybuilding SIG, and of course I went to it, and lo and behold, there was was Mike Ashley. So I I did my fanboying for a minute. Um, talked to him about what I do and, and and what 3D Muscle Journey is about and all the things. And uh, it was just really inspiring to me to see someone who had truly achieved the pinnacle in his chosen sport. Um, but there he was, uh, you know, at the time in his, in his mid to late 50s, still trying to learn everything he could, motivated uh, and, and very humble. And just you could tell that that his perspective uh, I don't know if it's just who he was and he brought it to bodybuilding or whether he learned it through bodybuilding and then brought it through his education, but he was still just as passionate about learning about how to improve his game as a lifter, uh, even though he was an Arnold Classic pro champion and, you know, had, had been on, on the planet, uh, you know, a solid uh, 20 years more than I had. And he was happy to listen to me and hear my thoughts and, and all that. It just was really impressive to me as, as a human being, let alone a bodybuilder. So just really, really great great stuff that I think uh, every personal trainer, athlete, or just lifter in general can take from, from what you brought up. That's a, that's a great description of Mike Ashley because <laughs> he is a humble guy. He is a very uh, accomplished bodybuilder, uh, and he's a guy that never stops wanting to learn. <clears throat> mm. And we first met, believe it or not, at a uh, when I first moved here years ago, it was 96 maybe, there was an NSCA state conference. And we did a state clinic, I should say. And uh, we did stations outside where we were going through SAQ drills. And he was just getting involved in the NSCA at that time. And he was going from station to station. I think, believe my station was uh, plyometrics. So when he came over to me, he already uh, tweaked his hamstring from doing something else. You can imagine a big bodybuilder going to SAQ. Mm -hmm. You're not used to that. But he was trying everything, you know. So I, I busted his chops a little bit about uh, bodybuilding and not being able to walk across a parking lot without pulling a muscle. And and we became <laughs> from that point on, we became best of friends, you know, but he is uh, he's a class guy. And uh, I, my hat's off to him. There's you know, there's a lot of bodybuilders out there that are really full of themselves. And I, mm. I, I kid around and I say they can't walk from here to the door without looking themselves in the mirror. And there's other guys that are they're passionate about what they do and uh, humble enough about what they do, uh, and but still focus on on their goals. And and uh, you know, I, I I appreciate, I admire that in bodybuilders that that are mm. like that. You know, um, but yeah, that's that's the other advantage. I'm blessed to have come across all these people. When you take a look at how many people, the longer you're on this earth, the more people you get a chance to meet, and hopefully they're good people, and uh, mm. people that have a, a common 
uh, something to share with in common with you. And uh, I, boy, I tell you what, I've just been blessed with the people I've come across from a coaching standpoint or people I've competed with or teachers. You know, I teach for 10 years here, but teaching is actually coaching. And I look yeah. at it from a coaching. I coach these kids. I don't teach them, you know, and they view me as a coach. And uh, in my experiences, I think, make learning for them a little bit more enjoyable and, uh, and, and maybe stick stick in their soft brains a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 Coach Picka, I just want to say we, we very much appreciate the time you've given us. Um, I, I totally agree with, with, uh, with, with what you've said, and you've had a very interesting, long, and successful career. And, you know, early on in the podcast, you attributed a lot of that to, uh, you know, politics, luck, being in the right place at the right time. But at the very least, the, uh, the, the, the compliment I want to give you is that when presented with these opportunities, it very much seems like you capitalized on them. Uh, and it's not only made you uh, successful, but it's also been something that you can share with our audience. And I think everyone hopefully learned some something from uh, from the lessons you, you've had. Uh, at this point in the podcast, Omar, unless there's something you wanted to bring up, I wanted to give uh, Jan the opportunity just to say if there's anything that we just didn't get to cover or any elements that you wanted to spend some more time on, this is your, your moment just to, to say to say your piece if there's anything we, we, we glossed over that you'd prefer to spend a little yeah. more time on. Yeah. No, listen, I, I, oh, yeah, I'm i sorry. Go ahead, Omar. No, I was, I was just going to echo basically what Eric said. I think this is cool for the listeners because this is kind of keeping with the lineage, Jan, of the mentorship idea of the individuals that helped you along the way. Now you spreading knowledge to hopefully uh, individuals that maybe want to be SNC coaches. I know definitely there's a portion of our audience that are personal trainers, uh, educators, people looking to get into the space. So to have the opportunity of someone that has lived it, breathed it, learned it, and taught it for so long to speak, I think keeps in that tradition of uh, kind of what you echoed. And I found myself relating to that where you're passionate about this. And so as soon as you got out of school and you're at gyms or you're seeing people lift, you kind of just started helping them for free. It wasn't like, well, let me try and sell you this program. It's like, you're just you're just naturally trying to do these things. So no, absolutely what Eric said. Anything that you want to circle back to, man, would be... Uh... Listen, you, I, I appreciate your time and you guys got a really good thing going here to, uh, to uh, educate people out there, uh, make them aware of stuff that's maybe not uh, uh, easily reachable. When I think about uh, getting information out to people about training, uh, there's a lot of stuff that, that people will hey, get my tongue tight here. Mike Ashley came to me one time. He took several of my classes here. And, uh, and he would say to me after class, he goes, you know, Jan, this is amazing stuff. I said, how amazing is it? I said, it's biomechanics. He goes, yeah, but the trainers, there's a lot of people out there. The way you explain it, it, it makes so much sense. You know, and and maybe if they understood the way you explain it to them, they would be able to train people a little bit better. Um, so I, I think it's about educating, maybe taking a different approach. Maybe people are seeing everything come down the same highway. And and perhaps, as you said, you mentioned earlier, Omar, everybody's taken it's it's presented in such a, a, a format that they're either pulling it off the Internet or they're reading it from some uh, some blog that somebody put up and, and not really looking at the underlying uh, maybe uh, basis or the foundation of whoever it is that's making the comments. Uh, but to to give people different information, different ideas like like Dr. Zordos out here or what you guys are doing, uh, I think that's what people need. And I think you guys are doing a great job of uh of getting it out. I certainly appreciate the time with you guys and the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you. As you could tell, I have a passion for this stuff. We could talk for hours. Uh, you asked me what else I want to put in. We could do a couple, a couple of weeks of this stuff, all this stuff, <laughs> but there's so much, I really, you know, uh, it's not often you sit down with guys that have a, a similar passion. And, and I think I, I appreciate that very much. And uh, I want to thank you guys for having me on. Our absolute pleasure. And I, I just want to point out that Mike Ashley was sitting in a classroom at Florida Atlantic University on SNC. And for anyone who thinks they have perhaps finished learning <laughs> or because they've achieved a certain pinnacle in sport that they can't get better, uh, that, that is truly one of the best lessons of the Iron Game. And I think, uh, Coach Pica, you're a great example of that as well. So I want to thank you for being on. And as always, I'm going to leave it to Omar to do the closeouts because he's the closeout king. Uh, well, Again, I just want to echo that having you on, uh, Coach, has been fantastic and has been illuminating. And it's 
it's nice to see that there are those opportunities that if you're passionate about something that you can have a career out of this. I think one of the statistics is that some of those trainers, and I would say they're kind of, as you made the joke, you know, they're doing this kind of in the interim. And so the statistic is that within three years, I believe over 90% of trainers will have changed jobs or changed careers. So knowing that passion is the cornerstone of the foundation and living it, breathing it, and then the science experience and everything else comes with it. It's encouraging for individuals, especially in the social media age, where everything's kind of temporal, and everything is very quick and easy to speak with someone with a lot of experience, and a lot of insight which is fantastic. So I want to thank you for being on. I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode. You could help us out if you enjoyed this episode by leaving a rating and a review on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and like the video and leave a comment. We'll do our best to respond and we'll see everyone in that next episode every single Monday.